For many people, first sex and first love are defining experiences they'll never forget. He'd choose you to take his virginity over any day. Really? This is a film about what happens in our bodies and brains as we begin our sexual lives. Chris is trying to pull a girl. He's like, well, he's a slut. We follow young people as they set about losing their virginity. Adele, are you sure you don't want to try before you buy? <laughs> so we did, we tried it. No, we didn't. Yes. Ecstatic, would might be a better word. With access to cutting edge science and computer graphics, we show the massive impact these crucial rites of passage have. Here's the area where we're hoping to see the activity. It can be a roller coaster of emotions. Abortion is absolutely not a contraceptive choice. It's like the last resort of the last resorts. And what happens at the start of our sex lives can have a major effect on the rest of our life. I think of being a sneaky gay or just one of just be gay, person really. Through the highs and the lows, this is the inside story of how sex works. Sex is good. <laughs> it was really fun. In Leeds, 19-year-old Callum and 17-year-old Karina are in the first flushes of a new relationship. We've been together it was a month on Saturday, so just over a month now. Yeah, early stages. Callum plucked up the courage to ask Karina out one Saturday night at the local park. I had to have several aids with that courage, if you know what I mean. So, uh, what do you mean? Let's put a simple at our drunk. He took my hand, led me over to the barriers over there and says, Karina, I might be a little bit drunk, but Please, will you go out with me? I was like, yeah. Did I say please? <laughs> I don't know. I was like, yeah. Go on then. Callum and Karina have not had sex yet, but Karina lost her virginity in a previous relationship. Thinking back on my first time, I wasn't... I was happy at the time, and I don't regret it, because I never regret something that made me smile at one point. Callum, however, has not yet found the right person. I'm still a virgin. Which a lot of people might, you know, a lot of my mates, the the mock me. I've never really cared. If it's your first time having sex ever, then I do think it's important for you to have it with, you know, someone who means something to you. It should be quite special. Tonight, Karina is cooking for Callum round at her place. This is the first night we'll spend together. Should be all right. But I think women tend to think, see things like this as a lot more romantic as men do. I'm not expecting, oh, if you know what I mean. You know, I don't expect to have sex with her tonight, to put it straight forward. You look quite nice, actually, so. I just can't really go a day without thinking about him. I get excited when uh, I go to meet him as well, thinking, oh, what, what are we going to do today? What's our little adventure for today? What happened to you? Thank you. Do you think about her a lot? Might sound a bit bad if I say I never think about her, but I do think about her, but I'm, I don't, she's not always on my mind. I know a lot of people who, who they'll be going out a week and they'll be deeply, madly in love, <laughs> but I, I've never believed that. I don't think love just happens like that. At the moment, I'd say I'm, I'm deeply attracted to her. I like her a lot, but not love. This is like really surreal. What is? I'm eating bacon, chicken and cheese with a glass of pink juice. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do think I'm falling for him. I know something about him, I think. Have you told him? No, I'm too shy. Most young people start to develop an interest in sex and relationships after puberty. Oh, yeah. Which happens at an average age of 11 for girls and 12 for boys. It is the most tumultuous time in any individual's life. So you've got this extraordinary explosion of hormones in men and women. And it's no surprise that it is associated with some quite radical behaviour. Puberty starts in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Messages are sent from here to the testicles in boys and the ovaries in girls, telling these glands to massively increase the production of sex hormones. In males, the main sex hormone is testosterone. In females, it's called estrogen. These hormones are transported around the body in the bloodstream, having been released at significantly greater levels than before puberty. At sites all over the body, the sex hormones dock at receptors, 
triggering major changes in our appearance and bodily function. In boys, genitals enlarge and sperm is produced for the first time. In girls, hips widen, breasts develop and periods start. As we become fertile, we start to explore sexual opportunities for the first time. Individuals, young men and women, are learning their, about their sexuality and learning what it means to be sexually aroused. In South Wales, a group of lads in their early 20s have all lost their virginity, but they're preparing for a sexual rite of passage of a different kind. Their first pulling holiday abroad. Well, we're off to Kavos, and uh, I think everyone, everyone goes to Kavos for one thing, um, sex, drink, or oh, two things. Hopefully there'll be plenty of women because uh, the statistics that he's come up with, <laughs> 10 guys to every girl, uh, <laughs> better bring some lube. <laughs> Four of us going on the holiday to Kavos. Um, we have Dan, Richard and Tom and myself. Richard's the party animal of the group. When he's drunk, he'll do anything, absolutely anything. He'll, he'll use his two-thumb joke that he likes to use. What's well, got two thumbs, speaks French and it has got a 12-inch penis. <laughs> Moi. <laughs> oh, no, but they're, they're always disappointed, obviously, because they can't speak French. So. <laughs> and unfortunately, I haven't been on a lad's holiday uh, abroad yet, so uh, the anticipation is, uh, is killing me, to be honest. Uh, I can't wait. Tour operators started offering cheap package holidays to young Brits back in the mid-1960s, although it wasn't until the 70s and 80s that these trips became established as a major sexual rite of passage. These days, thousands head out to resorts all over Europe for a week of sun, sea, and sex. Put your condoms in there. That's all that's in it. One of the aims is to chat the women up and, yeah, if we're lucky, go a little bit further. And we're live. It's been a while, so I want to get my leg off. <laughs> like, I want a, I want a bit of fun. <laughs> I'm 23 now. I can't really be gone on these holidays much longer. I have to get out of my system. I think it'll be uh, epic, I think. Memorable. In Gloucestershire, Andy and Odell have been going out for just under two and a half years and are about to experience a major step forward in their sexual lives. Andy and I are getting married in two days' time um, at the weekend. and we have decided and made a decision that to abstain from having sex before our marriage. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to... Adele and Andy are Christian youth workers and met when they were colleagues at the same charity. I'm a committed Christian, that's important to me in terms of the girl I seek. Amen. To have someone who I can marry who's got the same passions, the same goals, the same vision for all that is really important to me. Most of the young people Adele and Andy work with are not Christians, and the couple are open with them about their decision to wait until marriage before having sex. Were you scared the first time, boys? Not scared? Were you not? <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't me. Were you not? Fair Everybody's right. got their own opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a bit like, it's a bit of a crazy thing, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's it's like... just for you if you've waited so long, then yeah, fair enough, I suppose it is. But... So there's no sexual activity involved the whole of your 27 years? <laughs> what, do you, what do you call sexual activity? <laughs> what? Bar kissing. There was minimal sexual activity <laughs> prior to us getting married. <laughs> I feel sorry for it now. <laughs> it's so funny the responses that you get. You know, initially they say, well, how old are you? And you say, well, I'm 29. 29? And you're still a virgin? That's ridiculous. When you get married with someone, that's your lifetime partner, isn't it? And then you, like, lose your virginity to them and it's like falling down. But you don't have to wait, do you? It's a choice that you can make. Yeah. Why, why would you want to wait? Why don't you just, like... <laughs> Like, lose it, it and, like, you know, and feel the pleasure. <laughs> For me, it was about only having that experience with one person, and so I wanted to make sure that I waited till I was married. It's just natural to lose your virginity at 14 15. <laughs> get pregnant, get pregnant <laughs> by 16. <laughs> the average age boys and girls lose their virginity in the UK is 16. Adele and Andy's pledge to save sex until marriage in their late 20s has even surprised some of their friends. One of my really close girlfriends at the Hendry said, Adele, are you sure you don't want to try before you buy? <laughs> like, are you really sure? So we did, we tried it. No, we didn't. I do think about sex quite a lot. Adele's an attractive girl, so why wouldn't I? 
and for me that does excite me and I think it will actually really enhance the relationship or really strengthen our relationship and love for one another. With the ceremony just two days away, however, some nerves about the wedding night are creeping in. You know, for me, I'm slightly nervous about the fact that Andy's going to see me with no clothes on. And as a female, I'm slightly anxious about the fact that I've not got, you know, perfect body and got lumps and bumps in places and nobody's seen that yet. So all of that is new. Nerves before sex are natural, but can lead to physical problems during sex. And often this is down to poor blood flow. In men, when they are sexually stimulated, impulses are sent via the nervous system to the genitals. The nerves going through the penis then release chemicals that widen the blood vessels, which increases blood flow, producing an erection. Nervousness can impair these impulses, causing difficulty getting an erection. In women, there is a similar effect. Normally, sexual stimulation triggers blood flow to the vagina, which causes lubrication to make sex more comfortable. Anxiety can impair this blood flow, meaning the vagina is less lubricated, making it more difficult for women to get sexually aroused. Over in Cavos, the lads from South Wales have their own problems to deal with, as their dreams of a sex fueled holiday in the sun seem a little optimistic. Definitely near in the end of the season, right? The, the end of the season is coming up on this Friday. It is like a wild west, shan't you, Dan? It's a weird setup. I've never been to anything like this before in my life. It's so different than night. As night falls, the lads are determined to find some girls and get the party started. Nothing can dampen our spirits on, on a good night out. When there's plenty of girls, plenty of alcohol, bit of music, nothing can stop getting our way. The boys are three days into their holiday, and sex has not yet been a major feature. When it comes to kissing girls, however, one member of the group is way out in front. So tell me who's been the most successful so far. <laughs> well, the, I, the most successful, I would say, is myself. <laughs> Met a different girl every night. I think that makes me sound quite bad, actually. Griff's doing great, as per usual. Reflection on last night where he's pulled and he's just going back for seconds, I think. He loved a bit of secondary dessert, so to speak. He was trying to find her erogenous zones and he couldn't find it. So I had to find it for him, I said it's her neck. If you look, he's kissing her neck all the time. That's it, that is her main erogenous zone. When we kiss, our bodies go into pleasure overdrive. The lips and tongue are packed with nerve endings that are incredibly sensitive to stimulation. This sparks the release of the feel-good chemical dopamine by nerve cells in the pleasure centers of the brain. When dopamine attaches to receptors on neighboring nerve cells, it triggers feelings of euphoria and excitement all over the body. Some scientists believe kissing could be about much more than a fleeting moment of passionate pleasure. As more kissing leads to more release of other chemicals, such as the hormone oxytocin, which further stimulates bonding and desire between couples. So, as soon as that kiss happens, the buzz definitely heightens and you really feel a good adrenaline kick. It's definitely something that just sparks, I think, in the back of your mind. There's always that buzz where you're thinking, yes, here we go, job done. <laughs> Close to you right now. It is a bit of a holiday romance, and I'm, I'm sort of getting to like that. <laughs> He's a very open person, and I'm a, I'm a flirty person anyway, so we ended up just like flirting and giving a lot of banter to each other, and then things happened from there. Well, as you can see, then the night's gone pretty well, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think we're getting really naked, I think. <laughs> As the happy couple call it a night, the other lads consider their options. I'm Griff's best man. I'm going to be Griff's oh, best man. Oh, go on, girls, go on, please. Bonjour, hello. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. That's lovely. I'm going to be some more funny. <laughs> Bitch, don't leave me. Once our sex drive kicks in, we're naturally motivated to find a partner. 
And for the first time, we may experience with another person one of the most intense natural highs the body can create. Orgasm. In anticipation of an intimate encounter, sexual arousal builds. In men, foreplay triggers an erection as spongy tissue inside the penis fills with blood. In women, the clitoris and vaginal walls swell with blood, lubrication occurs, and the vaginal muscles relax. During sex, nerve endings in the penis and clitoris and wall of the vagina are stimulated as penetration begins. Nearing orgasm, both male and female brains crackle with activity and some 80 different areas become increasingly active. At climax, the brain sends signals through the body's nervous system to generate the physical and sensual effects of orgasm. In men, the result is muscles inside the base of the penis contracting vigorously, causing ejaculation. In women, waves of vaginal contractions are set in motion, spasming every 0.8 seconds. A few moments of pleasure, then it's over. For many, these intense sensations can be a formative experience as we begin our sexual lives. I'm okay. Callum and Karina have been spending every day together and the relationship has entered a new phase. Expand the feelings of how you're feeling. I'm fine. We were down on this little island thing and he's like, Karina, come over here, I need to talk to you. I was like, OK, then. But it's like, Karina, I might be a hypocrite, I've told you before, but I think I do actually love you. And my heart just, like, exploded, really. I was like, oh, wow. Cool. Had you so, planned to say it? No, it was quite spontaneous. It was just... I was just with her and I thought, I actually love her, so I'll, I'll tell her, because she's brilliant. For like the next week or so, I had a massive smile on my face. I was like, say it again. <laughs> I could tell it made her very, very happy. Ecstatic, would might be a better word. To me, love feels like loads of butterflies in your stomach and when I'm not with him, I think about him all the time. It is just knowing that someone is there for you and that you're there for somebody else, always. Karina is wondering if the couple's newfound love for each other will lead to the next big step in their relationship. Like, lately I keep thinking, are we actually going to have sex? You know, when? If? You know, all them type of questions, what if? I feel nervous for the obvious reason that it might just not work. There's a part of me thinking, what's Karina going to think? Well, well if, it, you know, if it don't work, is she going to fall out on me? Is she going to be upset? Is it, will it just destroy the relationship completely? No, that's like the dark, paranoid side of me coming out. Because the way I see it, because Callum hasn't had sex before, I always think, you know, he's waiting for the right person. I'm not trying to rush Callum, but, you know, I'm just thinking about things, you know. Oh, look at that. In New York City, scientists are trying to find out why the feelings of new love have such powerful ups and downs. Yes, I do. I love that. Actors Diana and Albert have been going out for seven months and have agreed to take part in a study. I actually think this is going to be the first time I've seen you drink a cup of coffee. I'm, I'm actually quite surprised by that. From afar, eh? We met in rehearsal at the Living Theater, and I remember seeing him in rehearsal, and he was wearing his like workout gear. That I was green not wearing thing. workout gear. Everything you wear looks like you look like you're wearing workout gear right now. Just give me a kiss. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Today's experiment is one of the first to look at brain activity during early stage intense romantic love. What we're gonna do is scan the brain of a young woman who says that she's madly in love. And what we're trying to find out is exactly what is going on in the brain when you feel that elation, the euphoria, the giddiness, the uh, possessiveness, the motivation, the craving, the obsessive thinking of early intense romantic love. First of all, Diana must be assessed to check she is sufficiently in love to take part in the test. What were some of your bodily reactions when you began to feel that you were really interested in him? And I remember the second he walked in, it was like, <laughs> it was like shaking. I'm, I'm sitting at the desk, I'm doing my keyboard thing, and I was just so happy. He was there, you mm -hmm. know, just like elation and warmth. Elation. 
elation. That's a total major elation. aspect of intense romantic love. <laughs> so yeah, that's what love is like. It's yeah. a very powerful experience. We need right. to capture you in that intense feeling of romantic passion for right. Albert. Diana has agreed to go into an fMRI scanner to see which parts of her brain are most active when she thinks of Albert. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm excited, I'm excited. Okay, bye. 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 <laughs> In the scanner, Diana is shown a favourite photo of Albert on a loop for four seconds at a time. <laughs> then to cleanse her mind, she is asked to count down in increments of seven from a random number. Finally, Diana is shown a photo of a friend she has no romantic feelings for. The research team is looking for differences in brain activity when Diana thinks of Albert compared to when she thinks of her friend. Well, here's the area where we're hoping to see the activity. We're hoping the scanner can pick this up because we know it's there. Right. <laughs> it's just a little factory near the base of the brain, right? And the team suspect the ventral tegmental area in the brain is particularly active in the first stages of romantic love, releasing large amounts of the chemical dopamine. Dopamine is a natural stimulant. When you see a picture of your lover, the dopamine system is triggered to give you that intense rush of intense infatuation. Dopamine pathways in the brain produce focus, craving, goal-oriented behaviours and motivation. In this case, the motivation to win the love of a would-be partner. These are really great results. They're very specific for this lower brainstem area that we saw active. Here we are, romantic love. Boy, to be able to put your finger on a, a little dot. Diana, the experiment's over and we're coming to get you. Perfect. Here we go. Some scientists believe the strong drive to be together many new lovers experience is essential to our survival. Romantic love has a, an important evolutionary purpose, which was to enable the brain to focus that mating energy on just one individual and start the mating process. So I take it your brain is still intact? Mm -hmm. And indeed, it's the most important thing that we do. It is this way that we pass our DNA on to tomorrow. Were you nervous? Yeah. <gasps> yeah <don't. laughs> I was actively thinking about Albert, and I just got these like images of the future. Rather than thinking about the past, suddenly it shot to the future of, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Two months, 10 years. <laughs> 15, 20, 30, 40. And I was just, I realized I was smiling the whole time. Today, Odell and Andy will celebrate their love in front of 500 guests when they get married. And after the ceremony, they'll be free to explore sex for the very first time. It still doesn't really feel like it's my wedding day, but I don't feel nervous, I just feel really excited. Andy and his ushers are posing for pre-wedding photos when word comes through from the bride's house. She's wearing white, apparently. White means for a virgin, traditionally. It's more purity, isn't it? Are you wearing white, Andy? <laughs> Some of Andy's mates also waited for marriage before having sex. I did give Andy a bit of advice, but I need sort of... More spirit. Nothing too serious. I'll leave it for him and Adele to work out. <laughs> the mechanics. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be fine. Um, I gave him some advice, more practical advice really. Pack your digestives under one of the pillows because you've got to keep your stamina up. <laughs> <laughs> Refraining from sex has not always been easy for Odell and Andy. I'm a red blooded male, so when me and Odell are getting intimate, you know, your heart does beat faster, you do get excited, you're, you start to think with other things other than your head. Men and women are different in terms of when they become sexually excited. Andy is like a, a gas oven. You turn it on and it's instant heat, ex you know, excitement, and there's a big flame. And other men, not just me. And you turn it off and it goes straight away. Whereas for women, they're more like an electric oven. They take longer to heat up, but the moment that they have got hot, it actually takes them longer to cool down. I think Adele's a lot better at this than I am. She can tend to sort of step back. I think we've probably had sex by now if it's over to me. <laughs> give you this ring as a sign of our marriage. With my body, I honour you. All that I am, I give to you. Well, it gives me great pleasure to now announce you as husband and wife. You may celebrate with them. You will be fantastic when we do have sex in like the 
context of marriage and the fact that we can both enter that without having previous sexual experience is fantastic. First time sex can often be a case of trial and error, but the fact that Odell and Andy are deeply in love may stand them in good stead. Some scientists believe that particularly when women are in love, they have better quality orgasms and can achieve orgasm more easily than those who aren't. In tests, this has been linked to a brain region called the left insula, which showed greater activity when women saw their beloved's name written down. The more satisfied the female test subjects were with the quality of orgasms in their sexual relationship, the more this brain area was activated. I've had the most perfect day ever. I'm never intended to do this again, so it's the best thing that's ever happened. It's just great. It's such a fantastic reception. There are lots of people here that I love and respect, which is amazing. Obviously, just to show that Adele was incredible. At the reception, conversation turns to the wedding night. We've talked openly about, about obviously, tonight and the night and what it might be like, and what to expect and all those type of things. And I think they're looking forward to an awful lot. In fact, we can't see them now. They might even... <laughs> we would view sex as something much more than a physical act. Mm. It's got emotional aspects to it. Within a loving context, and it is fantastic because it's that relationship that leads to good sex. It's that, that love, that commitment, where it leads to a good sex life. Choosing when to have sex for the first time and who with is a major decision, and we don't always get it right. 20% of young men and over 40% of young women feel they had sex for the first time too soon. In recent years, a small minority has taken the extreme step of resorting to cosmetic surgery in an attempt to return themselves to the physical state they were in before first sex. The procedure is called hymenoplasty. The hymen is a thin, fleshy membrane that is found at the opening to the vagina. When the hymen is stretched, it can rupture, which sometimes causes bleeding. For a long time, it was believed an intact hymen was evidence of virginity and that it would be broken the first time a woman has penetrative sex. However, the hymen can be ruptured in many different ways, such as horse riding or through the insertion of a tampon. Despite this, in some cultures, the hymen is still symbolic of virginity. What we do in a hymenoplasty is recreate that barrier so that uh, it re-virginizes, uh, so to speak, the patient. Today's patient is Judy, a committed Christian who regrets losing her virginity to a high school sweetheart. She's asked to be anonymous as she feels she will be ostracized if it becomes public she's not a virgin. I was born into a very, very conservative Catholic home. Sex before marriage is not allowed at all. He was my best friend. We did date for a little while in high school and it was, it was hard because he had really strict parents and I had very strict parents. He had told me that he was in love with me. He did propose to me. So I said yes and you know, we're engaged and then one night it just happened. Judy and her boyfriend had sex once. Then two months later, he disappeared. She eventually caught up with him on Facebook. He messaged me back saying, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I got married a week ago. I met the most amazing girl ever, and I had to leave because I loved you too much. I was in shock. I, I gave him my virginity. I gave him something sacred that at the time, I felt like I wasn't going to get it back, ever. Hymenoplasty costs between two and four thousand pounds and is relatively rare, with this clinic in the US performing just seven procedures a year. The first step is to expose the area so then one can actually see what is going on. You can maybe a little pinch. And then the second step, the edges are freshened up. I mean cutting the old scar that has formed on the free edge of the hymen, allowing a bleeding edge to form. And then the Final step is a suture on the outside layer of the hymenal wall that faces the exterior. Now, of course, you don't want to tighten it too much. Otherwise, the next time you have sex, it will be exceedingly difficult. Nothing can change how Judy lost her virginity. 
but she hopes this procedure will make her feel more comfortable about the prospect of first sex with her current partner, who she thinks she will one day marry. He wants to know that he is the only one I have ever been with. The night of the wedding, he is expecting to see blood on the sheet. So here's now the repaired hymen. After a few months, oh, I don't think even a doctor would be able to tell. Maybe I won't be that 100% virgin that I once was, but I will be one again. And that's what I'm looking forward to, just being a virgin again and being myself. In Cabos, it's another night on the pool and the lads are reaching for a spot of Dutch courage. The booze is really cheap. I tried loads of cocktails, fist balls. Sex on the beach. Blue Lagoon, the head fucker. Where we come from, they don't really serve those sort of drinks. Yeah. They don't measure your shots. It's purely just slapped in the glass. Let's go. Really good. Um, very, very messy. There's a lot of atmosphere in that. But yeah, it's, it's class. As the booze flows, the lad's confidence with women seems to rock it. If I didn't have a drink, I probably wouldn't approach them. I think it stops you from thinking about what you're going to say. When we have an alcoholic drink, it washes down to the stomach and into the small intestine, where it rapidly absorbs into the bloodstream and is sent pumping around the body and to the brain. In the part of the brain responsible for social inhibitions, nerve cells talk to each other by sending chemical messages that influence how we act. If we see someone we fancy but can't get the courage to talk to them, it's messages sent from this area that are inhibiting us. Alcohol depresses the ability of this part of the brain to send and receive these chemical messages. And we become much less inhibited and much more self-confident with potential sexual partners. I think the alcohol makes me not care about how I'm coming across. Yeah, I'm definitely the person who needs that. Bit of Dutch courage in you know, to up the ante and get in there, so to speak. Booze doesn't just make us less sexually inhibited. Scientists also reckon we actually fancy more people when we're drunk than when we're sober. It's called the beer goggles effect, and it's a phenomenon customers at a pub in South London are all too familiar with. Beer goggles is the ruin of all our mankind. It means you start looking at women and you think they're sexy when they're not. Put it this way, I've seen what she gets me when she's drunk. Scientists Lewis Halsey and Jörg Huber are carrying out an experiment to find out why people might appear more attractive after a few drinks. Their study is based around the idea that alcohol might affect our ability to detect asymmetry in the faces of others. People tend to find uh, mates or potential mates or partners more attractive when they're more symmetrical. It's all about finding a mate that will provide good genes to go with yours for your offspring and will also likely provide for your offspring well. You will be shown 20 pairs of faces. Okay. And the job is to decide which one is more attractive. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I find you very attractive at the moment. Yeah, that's kind of you to see. One face in each pair has been subtly manipulated to make it look more symmetrical than the other and participants must decide which they prefer. The theory that we were working on was that people who were more drunk uh, may be less able to see asymmetry in a face than people who are sober, and if they can't see the asymmetry, then they can't see that sort of lack of attractiveness, and therefore they see the face as being more attractive. After judging the faces, participants take a breathalyzer test to measure how much alcohol is in their bloodstream. 71. What does that mean? It's, really it's a fair number. amount. They're really high. So we found that sober people more often preferred the symmetrical face of a pair of faces when they had the choice than did the drunk participants. You preferred the symmetrical face just eight times out of 20. There's some reasonable evidence here, not conclusive, but reasonable evidence that a loss of ability to perceive asymmetry after drinking alcohol is at least part of the mechanism explaining what we call beer goggles. Drinking and dating may be fun, but winding up with someone we don't fancy is not the only risk attached. Surveys say that people are three times more likely to have unprotected sex when drunk. For men, the main method of contraception is the condom, 
which reduces the risk of STIs and pregnancy. For young women, the pill is most popular. It won't protect against STIs, but is around 99% effective in preventing pregnancy if used properly. It caused a storm when it came out in 1961. This little white tablet is more explosive than dynamite. What its effect will be on the future of mankind is something nobody can foretell. The pill prevents women from getting pregnant by interrupting the normal hormonal changes that control the menstrual cycle. Normally, hormones trigger the growth of what are called follicles in the ovaries of women. And every month, one of these follicles dominates the others in size and releases an egg, which can potentially be fertilized by sperm. The pill slows the release of certain hormones, which restricts the follicles from growing, and by extension, an egg from growing and being released for fertilization. The pill is only effective, however, if users remember to take it every day. Victoria went on the pill when she became sexually active in her late teens. I finished school at 18 and I'd kind of messed up my final year. I'd struggled with depression and things like that and had been just going out and drinking a lot. I was sleeping with a lot of people and I thought I was having fun, but when I look back at it now, I think probably 80% of the time I probably wasn't having fun. I think it was more desperation. Victoria's chaotic lifestyle meant she often forgot to take her pill. When I went home as somebody, I would know that I was going to have unprotected sex. I knew that I was going to be stupid. <laughs> Just can't talk about it with people back then. Couldn't, couldn't do it. Didn't want them to talk about it. Didn't want to have to deal with that kind of thing. Too much reality. I knew that the last person I'd slept with, I just knew that I was pregnant. I knew it, and it was a miracle that it happened, hadn't happened sooner. After confirming she was pregnant, Victoria went to her parents with the news. And they both came in to the lounge and just sat next to me on the sofa and just held my hand and just asked me what I wanted to do. And they were amazing. I told them that I didn't want to be pregnant, you know, I didn't want to have a baby. And they just said, OK. Abortion was legalised in the UK in 1967. The pro-life lobby argue abortion goes against the rights of an unborn child. There's been over four and a half million unborn children killed by abortion. Pro-choice groups view legal abortion as a major step forward in women's rights. Before 1967, the Home Office statistics showed that between 30 and 50 women a year died as a result of criminal abortion. Abortion rates increased slightly last year, and nearly 190,000 were performed in England and Wales. When Victoria opted to have an abortion, she felt she was just not ready to cope with becoming a mother. I wasn't willing to give up my life, you know, messed up as it was, I wasn't willing to change it that massively. When she arrived at hospital for her abortion, Victoria was sent for an ultrasound scan. You see people going for a scan on TV or your friends go for a scan when they're pregnant and it's a happy event and they see, they see the baby on the screen and they hear the heartbeat. Um, and so having, having that experience and it being a completely opposite feeling was very strange and it was horrible. Victoria had her abortion and left hospital the same day. A week later, however, she started to experience painful stomach cramps. The pain was so bad that it would wake me up in the night and I was doubled over like in excruciating pain. No painkiller would, would make it better. After three weeks, the pain stopped and she experienced a heavy vaginal discharge. I have no idea what it was, but it was something and it was big. It was round. It was grim. It was nasty. I went to my GP straight away and they basically said that it was remnants of the stuff that they had failed to suck out of my womb, basically, when I'd had the abortion. It was horrifying. What happened to Victoria occurs in just 1% of cases. Despite the complications she went through, she doesn't regret having an abortion. In the seven years since her procedure, she's travelled widely and has met her partner. The couple are now planning their wedding. Abortion is absolutely not a contraceptive choice. It's one of the most important things in the entire world, whether you have a baby or not. Um, you, you have to, you, if you're not, not gonna go through with that, you have to justify it. You have to, I, I have to live a better life. <laughs>
It's Karina's 18th birthday, and she's getting ready to meet up with Callum, although their relationship has been strained this week. He hasn't spoken to me all day. I've seen him, not to talk to her, but he hasn't he hadn't texted me or anything. <laughs> kind of upset, really. Keeps changing. Karina's mate Becky is good friends with Callum too. Like when you're upset, and I'll go over to him and be like, oh, this is bothering Karina, that's bothering Karina. The only thing that's bringing me down about is that he's just hardly showing me any affection, but when he does, I'm real happy. Despite their relationship troubles, Karina has high hopes for her special night. I hope tonight's going to be romantic. It's like, I'm going to be there, my boyfriend's going to be there. That's what I want, really. I'm so excited. We're off to the pendant. Ah! Your love is like a study Last week I said it's been a bit odd. She was, she was crying the other day because I'm good mates with this girl and Karina got a bit upset over it. I, I used to think Karina was all right with it, but it seems to be getting to her, so... Hello. Hey. Becky. I need to have words with Becky about some <laughs> After Callum and Karina's rocky week, it's down to Becky to mediate between the two and pass on some reassuring words. He'd choose you to take his virginity over anything. Really? Because he was good at tonight. Yeah. But tonight? He, yeah. Oh. <laughs> but he doesn't know whether he should or not because... Because of things. Yeah. Yeah. She's on a period, so I can't imagine anything actually happening. I love you. I love you too. You see, the thing is, because I'm a virgin, I don't actually know what goes on. <laughs> so it's a bit embarrassing admitting that, but I don't mind. But people have told me it's not a good, you know, it's not nice. There'll be plenty of other times when I could, but... Because I think that you two are going to be together for a hell of a long time. Do you think? Yeah. And he tells me how happy you make him. Really? Yeah. Because I bought him Nuki Brown? No, not just because of that, <laughs> but how happy you just make him in general. <laughs> If I was to lose my virginity, it would be her because he's the special one, she's the one in my life who I do love. Well, she's the best specimen of the female species. Love her, Matt. It's the morning after the night before in Cavos, and the lads are off to a water park. But some are struggling with the early start. How can you be so chirpy? <laughs> Rough, I think is the word. It's way too early. It's terrible. Not all the lads feel so jaded. Best night all week. Everything about it was just tremendous. For one of the group in particular, the holiday has exceeded expectations. I found someone this week up there. She's uh, yeah, one of the nicest girls I've met. Never really sort of been on a boys' holiday like this, so I didn't really know what to expect. But you know, you see from on the television programs, films, they're all sort of one-night stands, and so that's what I was sort of expecting. I didn't expect holiday romance, but no, I, I kind of like it. It's uh, it's good. With one night left. The others are reflecting on their own performance. Is it a disappointment to you that you didn't have sex this week? Yes. <laughs> it is a disappointment, really. Uh, anything can happen. But no night, it will happen. <laughs> Last night of the holiday now, so it's, it's a bit of a long trip home. I think I'm going to take it easy tonight. <laughs> Oh, there's been so many highlights this week. Uh, there's been pole dancing, pole dancing with fire up around us. There's been plenty of free alcohol, which is always a bonus. My age group should experience it when you're young. Just, just have fun and enjoy your, your teenage years or your young adulthood, I think. This has just opened my eyes so much now. Um, 
I want to experience more. <laughs> Where are you running off? I'm off for a rendezvous. With who? I'm a baby lady. I'm off for a rendezvous with a baby lady. Odell and Andy are fresh back from honeymoon and are adjusting to living together for the first time. So far, so good. Yeah, exactly. I'm getting used to a flat being girlified. <laughs> good, goodbye to a bachelor pad, so. Yeah. What's the point in having books, pebbles, whatever these are, <laughs> too many beauty products, candles? I don't really see any point in any of this, really. <laughs> After two and a half years together, marriage and moving in is not the only rite of passage Odell and Andy have been through. Yes, we have had sex for the first time. Yes, have we? we have. Yes, we have, Andy. <laughs> Glad you remember it so well. The best way I can say is it evolved and it was fantastic at times and at times it was perhaps laughable. <laughs> the best way I can put it. I thought it was going to feel really weird and it was going to feel a bit odd, you know. But actually, it didn't feel like that at all. It just felt totally right. But it has been kind of quite funny, like getting embarrassed at chemists and stuff. And... <laughs> so I was thinking, where do they even sell, you know, parts of, I don't know, lubrication and condoms and all that Where do they even sell it in Boots? Because they never bought it before, so they didn't have a clue. And, and then um... you feel naughty going up to the counter. <laughs> yeah, and that was all quite amusing. So um, Andy, at, as you can probably guess, just, you know, left me to pay and ran off so that I had to do it all on my own. I think for us it just reassured us that our decision to wait and the decision to put it into a married life and a strong relationship was the right one. It was really fun. Sex is good. <laughs> it was really fun. Next time, we explore what happens when we start to play the field. I love exploring sex as just as much as I love eating, and I love eating. From the pleasures, I've never had orgasm quite like it. The Valhalla orgasm. To the dangers... I was just given this what I thought at the time was a death sentence. ...of promiscuous sex in our 20s.